Today, Dreamlanders, we've got a very interesting couple with us, Ed and Chris Sherwood from Santa Monica, California. They are crop circle researchers, but also have had extensive paranormal experiences and involvement in this whole area and have had UFO experiences and, in particular, have successfully communicated with and called UFOs from time to time. And this is, of course, of interest to all of us because everyone would like to be able to do this, and we know it's possible. I used to do it from time to time successfully. Stephen Greer has his methods. Other people have their methods. But I thought from what I heard of what the Sherwoods had been doing, that maybe their ways of dealing with this were very much more sophisticated. Ed and Chris Sherwood, I would like to welcome you both to Dreamland. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Whitley. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Whitley. It's wonderful to see you. Well, wonderful. I'm so glad. And uh, we are all together now that Ann and I have moved to Santa Monica. I'm such a workaholic, though I rarely get out. So I think, Ed, I saw you on the street once a couple of years ago. That's or true. You recognized me, mm-hmm. and I had no idea who you were. And I was uh, there was a brief correspondence, but we weren't living here full time then. We were still all over the place, so we never never actually gelled. But we ought to get together at some point uh, and uh, see each other. It'd be really fun. I think you just live a couple of blocks away. Well, I'm not sure how far away we live, um, yeah, but we'd but, love to do um, that. Sometime. We could certainly meet. Yeah. Yeah, you live. Uh, you now it, where you do live is somewhat important to this to this show in the sense that um, uh, you, you tell us a little bit about your location and and what it's like and why you see UFOs there. Well, it's it's a busy city location. Um, I've lived here now for 14 years. Emigrated from England. And it's been a location that I haven't really, uh, really thought to be a good location to witness UFO sightings. And so for many years, uh, if I wanted to try a, a CE5 type of uh, uh, human-initiated interaction type uh, event, I would usually go to a remote location to do that, like I'd done for many years in England. But uh, in early 2006, I uh, was trying to recover from a serious illness, and while doing so, I would take short walks around the, the, the city blocks where we live and watch the sky and uh, reminisce almost about the, the times when uh, I would uh, do meditations in England, uh, earth healing and world peace meditations, either alone or with a group of people, and before to do so, to send out a mental invitation to any benevolent ET intelligences out there, um, near or far, um, to to participate in the meditation that I was going to do, if they were aware of it, and, and they could, and uh, it was safe for them to do so. And also, I would ask for permission, uh, if it was possible for anything to appear, to record that um, and at first, you know, I, I did this uh, more out of a, a, a nostalgic missing the times when I used to do this. Um, but I know that nostalgia very well. Yeah. And uh, just sitting at a bus stop, watching the sky, quietly doing the meditation, you know, not, not announcing it to anyone, but first doing that mental invitation, sending that, that psychic, uh, transmitting that psychic invitation. Um, an object turned up uh, in clear view. Uh, minutes after I sent it out. And this, of course, is something I'd witnessed many, many times in England. So it took me back a bit. And uh, I had seen one or two things over Santa Monica prior to that, but it was a case of um, uh, you know, I'm walking through the town. Uh, since childhood, I've had a, a clairvoyant ability uh, to sense the presence of objects when they are uh, in close proximity. Usually, uh, if an object comes within two miles of me, um, I'm, I'm like a weather barometer. I, I pick now, it up. Why is this, do you think? I think it's mostly to do with uh, the core purpose of my um, sole purpose in this lifetime. My, my uh, sole contract, if you like, um, to quote a friend, Tom, um, uh, that uh, I, you know, we, we all, I think, uh, come into this world with um, knowledge 
that uh, we commonly forget in the process of birthing and growing up and, and, and taking on uh, uh, the civilization we grow up in. You know, we forget a, a lot. And um, in my case, at a very early age, uh, just before I was nine years old, I had a, an extraterrestrial encounter experience that really turned my life upside down, uh, even as a nine-year-old child. Um, and, and what this in, uh, first initiating face-to-face -face encounter experience did for me was, one of the things it did was it, it made me aware that uh, we live many lives and that death, physical death, is not the end. And uh, so... Uh, and from that experience, too, I, I experienced uh, a flood of, of mental impressions. Um, I'm sort of not going through the whole account here, but, uh, you know, I witnessed the being uh, and uh, was, was terrified uh, when I had this experience initially. And uh, the being said to me, uh, don't be afraid, I'm not going to hurt you. Uh, and I was paralyzed at the time. And I remember as soon when as you I, say you were paralyzed at the time, do you mean that the being had paralyzed you, or you were ill? No, no, um, I was paralyzed by fear. Oh, fear! Uh, yes. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, that, I've had one or two. Uh, that is a, that is something that happens. Yes. Yes, yes. It, 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 it can completely, uh, in a way, ruin the experience, and it, it took some years to overcome that, but. Um, in this instance... Um, no, Ed, you're going really quickly. This phrase, it took some years to overcome that, is important to us because behind those words are an effort that you made. Could you describe a little bit about that effort for us because it's very important to those of us who are also trying to do this. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, fear is the biggest stumbling block I think we human beings have in our lives. And... Um, of all the fears we can possibly have, uh, they all seem to reduce down to just one fear, and that's the fear of not surviving. Um, whatever we perceive the threat to be, whether it's actual or imagined, um, it's a threat to our survival that really puts us in that fight-or-flight response. And I had a close encounter experience at age 15 where an object came within 30 feet of me while I was walking the family dog. And like the previous time that I just very briefly mentioned, which was a bedroom visitation experience that happened just before I was nine, this later one at 15, uh, again, because the object came so close to me and I had no prior warning, uh, even though for years I had asked for a close encounter, um, when it was suddenly given to me, um, I was frozen to the spot with fear again. And when this experience ended, it was a fairly brief experience, at least to my conscious memory, um, I was in, kind of annoyed uh, initially with the intelligences because of the way it happened. And then I was annoyed with myself because I thought, well, uh, it, when I really examine the experience, the conscious memories I have is that nothing negative actually happened to me except my own fear. So because I wanted to have more interaction experiences and I wanted to understand what was, what was happening and the truth of it, I understood that I had to learn to at least overcome my fear of the experience. Then perhaps I would be able to see what was really happening or I would at least be able to deal with it um, uh, more appropriately or respond uh, better. So the way I did that, this was I took myself off alone to woods and forests. Um, within, Wooden forest is in England? Yes, I was living in, growing up in Norfolk, a rural area of England uh, at the time where the highest number of UFO sightings were occurring at that time. This would be in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, in Norfolk, you have the, uh, or you had the American military air bases which had nuclear weapons. So uh, perhaps that's why there were so many sightings there. And I was living right amongst this. And so when I had this experience, which afterwards I thought, well, okay, the, the, the craft came within 30 feet of me. I was wide awake. Uh, it terrified my dog. It fled. It left me standing there. Um, and then I was frozen and unable to do anything. 
um, I realized that, you know, I had to overcome that. So I took myself off to woods and forests alone at night off the beaten trail, and I just sat in the darkness and learned to observe my thoughts, learned, uh, learned to, um, uh, you know, if I thought there was something negative there, if I heard a twig break, for example, and, and my imagination uh, turned that into, a, into a, a monster or something coming to get me. Um, I know it, the feeling. Yeah. I spent a lot of time out in the woods doing the same thing. <laughs> That's right. And I remember reading your book, um, uh, Communion, when it first came out, and then later Transformation. And I felt a connection with you um, as soon as I read that book, because you were the first other person that I'd actually heard say basically the same things that I had um, uh, said to trusted people and felt for years. Um, including uh, going out into the woods to try to, uh, you know, face your fears. Well, in, in my case, um, I learned to uh, observe my thoughts without believing in them. So, for example, if I imagined a bogeyman when I heard a twig or something else, I would observe that thought, but I would give all my attention to what my senses were really telling me. So I would listen. And I would, I would give all my attention, complete attention, to listening and sensing the wood around me. And what I learned was that 99.9% .9 of the time, there was no actual threat to me. So there was no actual reason to be afraid. Um, and also in giving um, importance to listening and sensing outwardly, so not just inwardly to, to your thoughts and then reacting to your thoughts, but, but listening outwardly to what's happening around you, and I became uh, more sensitive uh, in my sensory perceptions, and uh, I went out again and again and again uh, to the point where I, I discovered that I, or I found that I could uh, sense things beyond what I could hear, beyond what I could see, and it, it's like, um, like dowsing. Uh, but instead of dowsing for water, I, in this case, I'd be dowsing for the presence of another human being in the wood that I was in at night time, because usually uh, the most threatening um, thing to me would be another human being, uh, a poacher or a gamekeeper. And so I learned to sit there in the dark, off the beaten trail, with the, the wood around me uh, uh, coming alive at night time in the way it does, uh, listening to it learning the sound, learning not to react to fear just because I heard something move or, or an animal go past but I couldn't see it, um, observing my thoughts but not believing in them. And then when I did perceive things uh, that were clairvoyant, like uh, a person now has just entered the wood, a, a gamekeeper or a poacher, and I can't hear them, I can't see them, I can't hear them, but my mind is telling me someone is there in the woods, you need to leave. Uh, when I would do that, when I'd follow that intuition immediately, I would discover that effectively I wasn't alone, and, and yes, I did need to leave. And this was something that I fine-tuned, this, this exercise of going out into the woods, um, and it became very uh, useful uh, also for the encounter experiences because I found myself uh, very able to distinguish between um, clairvoyantly sensing the presence of an object that was either now there or coming, and and, and other things. And uh, soon after, I started studying more uh, parapsychology. Um, before I actually started studying parapsychology, ufology, um, I experienced it. And I have always felt that experience is your best teacher. And if you, you know, really want to gain a handle on this, uh, uh, these types of uh, subjects and experiences, you, you need to experience it. And obviously, you need to go through the, the initiation, if you like, for um, uh, self-realization of your own self, your, your own tendency to, to fear, you know, I say you, I mean everyone, myself included, at that time particularly. And the exercise I did over and over really taught me how to be fearless in the face of uh, these 
type of things. Not to say, though, that I never encountered fear again. But um, I had a much better, um, uh, uh, much better tools, if you like, uh, to, to deal with it, to know how to, uh, you know, if I perceive a threat, whether it's imagined or actual, instead of, of just listening to my thoughts and reacting uh, to fearful thinking, for example, I would then give all my attention outwardly to the world around me. So all my sensory uh, awareness is now outward, not inward. Is there really a threat there? Do I really need to run or, or move or, or do anything? And, and, and also to learn to trust, to recognize and then through experience trust your heightened sensory abilities. Because yes. once you learn to give complete undivided attention to your outer world, experiencing through your senses, your outer world, um, it, it gives you, at the same time, a quiet mind. It's in, in, in psychoanalysis and philosophy, it's, many people have called it a quiet mind. Uh, the more attention you give outward, the quieter you become inwardly. And in doing this, um, as I said, it, it became very, very um, useful in uh, learning how to sense yes. beyond my physical sensory limits. So, for example, if I suddenly now sense, oh, there's a UFO um, a mile from me, um, I might not be able to see it or hear it or have any sensory information at all, um, but uh, I now could feel it. I would then ask questions quickly within myself, like, uh, you know, is it friendly? Um, and instead of imagining or, or, or just reacting to the thought that there's a, a UFO close by, um, I would then give all my attention to trying to sense, uh, where is it? How many are there? Uh, is it benevolent? Uh, do I need to feel, uh, do I need to um, uh, protect myself in any way, or am I fine? Uh, and but to get to the point where I could do that and do it at will and do it very effectively, I more than 90% of the time, if I sense an object is nearby and it is going to become physically visible to myself and other people present, uh, I sense it. Um, but to learn to, to arrive, to have arriven at that point, uh, arrive at that point where I could do that most of the time, I had to go beyond, I had to learn to um, be fearless. And that means yes. to have this quiet mind, to observe your thoughts but not believe in them necessarily. Uh, see what now, you, Ed, you have mentioned a number of times that you were asking for benevolent presences. Does this mean that you think that there are uh, malign presences out there also? I, I, I think it's very much like we see on planet Earth. Um, you know, you, you look at six billion people and you see six billion people in different stages of self-knowledge and development. And I think if you were to expand that to the universe, um, you will find that there are intelligent civilizations um, there are, there are an uncountable number of civilizations, um, and many of them come here, or at least pass through here. And uh, of these, there are those that, in re if you were to have a relationship with them of any kind, uh, be it just a, a one-off encounter, or be it more, um, what I've experienced, and I can only really speak from my experience, is that uh, there are intelligences coming here that have their own agendas, and uh, they don't wish to divulge uh, why they're coming here. And then there are others that uh, won't tell you everything either, um, and I suspect it's because they are protecting uh, their activities and, and, and for good reason, but their, their motives are spiritual. They're not coming here because they need to take people or, or, or test them, abduct them for anything. Um, and they, they've been coming and going for a long, long time. I mean, both have. But it's like um, 
you know, if we send off, if eventually we develop a technology to the point here where we could send off a probe, um, you know, cancel the distance problem of, of traveling in space, and, and, and go somewhere and, and uh, go to other places. Uh, we would go there with our um, missions and our motives and intentions. And I think that you, you have all kinds. Uh, I mean, you have many kinds coming here, but you have uh, you have your very spiritual and very technically advanced, and you have your very technically advanced and compared to us, certainly, but who are not necessarily. Uh, very spiritual. I, I've thought that some of them might be very technologically advanced and inferior to us spiritually. Actually, I agree. I certainly, I certainly feel that. Um, uh, certainly, when when you encounter a being that seems to be unaware of uh, how you're experiencing them, if you are, uh, for example, um, I experienced a, a negative uh, encounter experience in 1993 too, actually from uh, what I recognize to be small gray beings who that tried to implant uh, me. And it was I was fully conscious at the time, and uh, they paralyzed me uh, against my will, and uh, it was very painful. I, I did everything to resist. Um, uh, you know, I... I, I well, I can't remember... Uh, say exactly why I said to them, but I was very, very annoyed. I felt very violated, and uh, they did it regardless. Now, did they implant you? Oh, yeah. Is it still there? Uh, I don't know. Have you ever t had been tested? Um, uh, well, let me put it this way. I know I have had more than one implantation. In fact, I, I've known I've been implanted since I was eight years old. In fact, long before people were talking about implants, I was actually telling uh, a few friends and several people actually witnessed um, uh, me go through an unpleasant reaction experience to an implant uh, when I was a child. And also, um, I would fight tooth and nail uh, when I was a preteen to not allow my parents to have me x-rayed if I uh, had an accident, which I had, you know, many bicycle accidents and other things. Because if you if you want to do it now, uh, a good process Dr. Roger Lear has is readily available. You could find out if you if there was anything physically visible in your body. Certainly, that's right. I well, I have a history of uh, implantations that tend to occur around every ten years of my life, and uh, I have said, uh, well, backtrack a bit. Um, when I was eight years old, um, I was I, I received a telepathic instruction from a being that I met one year later face to face. Um, this bedroom encounter I mentioned uh, uh, briefly mentioned earlier, um, an instruction that said to me, uh, "You have things in you to help communication with us. Uh, don't let people X-ray you because they will see them." So. Uh, I fought tooth and nail to avoid being x-rayed as a child. I didn't call them implants at the time. I never heard of implants. Uh, all I knew is I had objects in me. Later on, when I, when I met this being face to face. Ed, we're going to have to take a little break now. Uh, folks, we have, this is so captivating. We've just moved through the first two segments of Dreamland. We'll take a short break and then we'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online. Chris Sherwood's website, CropCircleAnswers.com. Don't miss it. One of the best Crop Circle websites out there. And in a few minutes, we're going to get into the whole Crop Circle phenomenon with Ed and Chris because they are experts in this field also. And Ed's actually seen one, maybe Chris too will find out, uh, being uh, created now. Let's get back, though, to this business of implants. And, of course, I've had uh, the implant in my ear, as everyone knows on this show, uh, attempted to be removed by a doctor, and was not he was not able to get it out, but it's certainly there. There's no question about it. Uh, we recently uh, had a, a scientist on Dreamland who uh, uh, whose implant was broadcasting in the FM band, and Dr. Lear has found four objects broadcasting in the FM band in different people. And I think, Ed, it would be really interesting if it turned out you were broadcasting, and that could be done without x-rays if you wanted to uh, have uh, signal acquisition equipment brought to you and 
find out if you're broadcasting. I, I would be interested to know because uh, uh, I have a history of it. And uh, after my initial experiences with it and being told what they were for, um, I basically developed the attitude where, and I, you know, I'd send this out to the universe. Uh, I don't mind being implanted, provided it doesn't interfere with my sole mission on this, Which is what? in this lifetime. Well, um, to uh, just uh, to say it very quickly, I've always felt my purpose in this life was to uh, help raise awareness of other realities to the to the ordinary reality that we uh, grow up with, the realities of um, non-human intelligences, uh, extraterrestrial, for example, um, awareness that we uh, are not alone, awareness that we live many lives, awareness of uh, human consciousness, what, what it is and what can it do. And, and, and how we can advance that. Uh, what, what do you think the primary thing that it can do that we're ignoring is? And I know that's a bit of a complicated question, but uh, if, you could, if you could put your finger on one general area that we ignore, that you feel we should not ignore and we don't need to ignore, what would it be? I think it is to approach the, the subject in a spiritual way, uh, really. Because though there are intelligences out there that have high technology and advanced psychic uh, abilities, we know from our own history that just because you have an advanced technology, it doesn't mean you're more spiritual or even as spiritual. Um, and, and so for me, uh, approaching the reality that we're not alone Knowing that there's more than one kind, uh, they're coming here with different reasons, different intentions, motives, benevolent, not so benevolent, if you were to have an interaction with them, you know, different kinds. Um, it's important, I think, to remember at all times, regardless of how you feel as a human being, when you're, in, 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 uh, when you're experiencing these other realities in the form of extraterrestrial contact, is that you are a cosmic being. Beyond being a human being, beyond being English, French, German, you know, wherever you come from on planet Earth in this lifetime, you are a soul. And your soul has, has lived um, uh, many lives, though you may not know it or remember it. Um, it's actually a, an aspect of consciousness that we uh, forget. It's, it's necessary, in fact, um, that we don't recall all the details of our past lives because we wouldn't be able to function in this lifetime. So um, I feel that in the face of, you know, if you're going to have a, an interaction with a being that comes from somewhere else, has high technology, uh, very advanced psychic abilities and awareness compared to yourself, um, it, it's very empowering to you as the experiencer to know that no matter what happens, good, bad, ugly, um, you are a cosmic being. You are a soul, and you have rights as a soul. And there's nothing that they can do to you that can take that away from you if you realize it. So um, you might have uh, experienced that... Uh, you know, being in presence of, say, uh, a, a, a grey who wants to uh, do something to you against your free will or what seems to be against your free will at the time, uh, even though you might not be able to stop it physically in that moment, there are things you can do, uh, things you can transmit mentally um, that broadcast to this other intelligence. You know, you, you are offending me as a human being. Um, and, and maybe you're offending me more than that, in that um, you are offending my, my uh, soul journey. Maybe you're not. But it's, uh, that's, you know, that's for the individual to, to, to work out within themselves by examination of the experience. But to realize that 
before, for me, it was very empowering to understand at a very early age that I was a cosmic being, not just a human being, that I had a soul, and the energy of that soul is my mind, the, you know, the consciousness of that soul is my mind, um, the energy of my mind is psychokinetic, and uh, the energy of my thoughts, my intentions, my attention, and my emotions, and... Um, you don't have to be uh, a victim in this situation or passive. You can actually become very active. You can take the initiative. And that, to me, is what I see five is all about. Um, uh, from what I uh, know, um, Stephen Greer coined this term uh, back in, when, whenever it was, 92 or before, of a close encounter of the fifth kind. But... Um, my definition of that is slightly different uh, in, in that I think it is very, very simply a human-initiated encounter uh, with one or more UFO or extraterrestrial being. It's, it's a, an encounter event that uh, doesn't happen until you take the initiative. Uh, in many other cases, or usually, it's the other way around. It's the, the ET intelligences, whoever they are, which group, whichever group it is, who takes the initiative or initiates you, um, and you are the recipient or, or, the, or the, you know, in some cases, the passive recipient. Right. Um, it's important if you want to, I think, understand the truth of it, get to the bottom of it, uh, overcome your fear of it, uh, that um, you understand who you are. And that includes understanding that you are a soul being. Uh, you are born of this universe, but there is something about you and everybody else, every self-aware, thinking, intelligent being, be it human or non-human, that includes the extraterrestrial beings coming here, is that all of us have a soul. That soul is the, you know, the energy of our consciousness. It's timeless. It's um, non-destructible. Um, and uh, you know, there, there is um, it changes your perspective, I think, to to understand that. What do you think about things like soul mining? Uh, are you familiar with that phrase at all? No. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I just will just for listeners' sake, there is, there are people who believe that the the Greys are literally mining souls here; that they're taking souls. Soul eaters, they've been called also. And I'm, you know, you've, I'm just wondering if you've ever had that impression of something that had, um, had a very predatory intentions toward you. Not, not exactly, not, not like that exactly, but what I would say is, uh, your soul is energy. The consciousness of your soul is your mind. It's your collective consciousness. You know, each and every one of us is a collective consciousness in our own right, just by ourselves, as is, as is the, the truth for all extraterrestrial beings, in my understanding, because it is uh, the very nature of consciousness. For example, every one of us, uh, a part of our con uh, collective mind, collective consciousness, is the unconscious. There's also the subconscious, there's the conscious, what you're aware of right now, and then there's the superconscious, and those four aspects of our uh, collective consciousness, we all have within us. You know, we, we experience things even in this lifetime that we forget. They drop away from our conscious awareness into our subconscious if they are things that we have recently encountered or, or, or um, near to us in some way, or they are um, distant things. They fall into our unconscious mind. Same, I think, is true for uh, our many lives, our many soul lives. Um, we forget what's happened before. We remember more what's happening right now. And um, now we're a collective consciousness within ourselves, but we're also a collective consciousness altogether. As, for example, as a species, humanity as a species is a collective consciousness. I mean, you think of six billion people six billion people who all have, um, you know, collective unconscious, 
collective subconscious, collective conscious. I mean, imagine what six billion people are aware of right now in this very moment, moment to moment, as your collective conscious and uh, collective superconscious. And I think this is true for other civilizations, planets, species too. And just like we are individually on different levels of self-knowledge and awareness, so, so is it um, on a planetary scale, and if you look at a universal scale. And We're going to take a little break now. Uh, we'll be back with Ed and Chris Sherwood. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. We go deeper. We're back in our last segment with Ed Sherwood and Chris Sherwood, their website, CropCircleAnswers.com. And Ed, I would like to move a little bit now into the Crop Circle aspect of this, because on your website there is a lot of really marvelous uh, information and uh, things that you've learned about Crop Circles, including actually seeing and being in the presence of a uh, light that that made a crop circle in 1992. Could you tell us a little bit about this, largely because, you know, you're not the only one I know who has had that very experience, so has Linda Moulton Howe, with that very same sort of light. So uh, do tell, if you will. Yes, uh, this, this occurred in, in Wiltshire in England in, in 92, and uh, what I witnessed preceding the creation of a new crop circle formation was an, uh, an amber-orange looking fireball uh, about 20, 25 feet in diameter, uh, about a quarter of a mile from me at, at the most. And I have witnessed more than 100 of these, and Chris and I have witnessed these, and we've also uh, videotaped them. Uh, there are parts, different parts of the world where uh, they tend to occur more than elsewhere. Yeah, that, that's actually something I've written several um, articles on our website. You can find a lot of information about this atmospheric plasma, ball plasma uh, effect. Uh, it's a phenomenon that occurs at energetic locations where Earth energy is interacting with cosmic forces, and they're frequently seen in England, and they have been seen in and around areas where crop circles have been um, discovered or they've appeared where sacred sites, sacred stone circles have been erected probably by the ancients knowing that these particular spots had this energy that they um, saw as magical and otherworldly. Or perhaps that they understood very well. Yes. In, it, it, uh, because I, I would suggest that <laughs> we once had a higher science than we do now. We once had a science that 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 was based in in the understanding of the soul rather than mm-hmm. what we have now, which is material science. Yes. Oh, yes, mm-hmm. very much, I think so. Yeah. The material world distracts so much from that kind of inner knowledge, and it's yeah. just been lost over the centuries. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we think this is one of the purposes of, of these times and, and the signs and crop circles and in the sky that we've been experiencing is, is to help make people more aware of, of this, these realities before, you know, we're at a very critical time in, in Earth's history and in, in humanity's history, and uh, these signs are trying to um, call our attention to these subjects. To, to, to enable us to regain this, and, and, yeah. and in a sense there's the feeling, isn't there, that if, you know, that they, the, the, the negative side of this is there too and perhaps will continue to exploit us until we do gain our own footing and uh, maybe That's right. maybe it's actu- actually not so negative at all but it's negative in the sense of uh, it making you stronger if you swim against the current exactly yeah. um, that's true for every experience we have in our lives you know the most negative ones uh, we, if we learn from them well, they can make us stronger uh, yeah. Now, there's a link on your old site, and their site is cropcircleanswers.com. Is, there's a link on it that d- doesn't work. It's actually a dead link, but oh, it fascinates okay. me anyway. It's the one about cr- relationship between crop circles and underground water and the underground in general, and I'm sure you can talk to that oh, even though the yeah. link is, is dead. Oh, we didn't realize that was a dead link. I think that one has changed a couple times, but we know that study It's the um, aquifer study that was done many years ago. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> tremendous evidence uh, both 
in ufology and in, in crop circles that the uh, phenomena uh, concentrate at locations where there is uh, underground or above ground water sources. And also in the case of, of crop circles, something I noticed uh, many years ago, uh, and that was that also atmospheric conditions when there is uh, a lot of water moisture in the air, so not rain but mist or, or water vapor. And in my research and experience of, of crop circles, for example, I, you know, I've witnessed uh, more than 200 UFO sightings, and uh, half of those, at least, were of this type of UFO that uh, is basically uh, a ball plasma, um, an ionized uh, mass of energy, uh, electrified. A, a plasmic gas. being, do you think they're alive, what you're talking about? Well, alive in so much as plasma is alive, but not alive in the sense of a self-aware thinking intelligence for the soul, no. No, but um, the interesting in, thing about plasma is that it is it psycho is interactive. interactive, and we, we have yes. a lot on our website writing about this and I mean, more, documenting it. More than 90% of the universe is made up of plasma, whether it's in a, a concentrated form or a disassociated form. Because so, uh, I met a man uh, some years ago. I uh, t transcribed some of the things he said to me in a book called The Key. And he, said, one of the things he talked a lot about was conscious energy. And I found that very interesting. It does, do you feel like this is what you're looking at when you're dealing with this? Well, this is what I've been saying since early 91. I've asserted this uh, since the beginning of 91. I've informed practically every crop circle researcher I've met. Um, that from my experience, when I began crop circle research in 1984, is uh, that uh, this is a uh, natural slash supernatural phenomenon. In fact, if you were to ask me who and what's been creating the worldwide crop circle phenomenon, I'd have to say there are three, so three basic sources. There's actually more than three, but they've reduced down to three. One uh, is uh, human uh, people, uh, individuals and groups going out and mechanically making circle, particularly since 1990 when the subject became world news. Um, obviously, there's more than one individual, there's more than one group, but you could say that one of the sources of the world crop circle formation is people. Uh, imitating, copying, hoaxing, rehashing, doing their own thing out there in the field, deceptively for the most part. Another source, though, is an extraterrestrial one. We know from the, uh, from the UFO record uh, going back more than 50 years that there have been many uh, eyewitness sightings of objects going down into vegetation, taking off, flying away, and leaving behind a simple circle or sometimes a set of circles, all ground trace evidence uh, that is similar. So, uh, and again, there, there is more than one extraterrestrial uh, intelligence group, civilization, coming and going. But again, you could sum it all up as one. So you've got two sources. But really, in our view, most of the non-man-made crop circle formations that have appeared since 1980 have been caused or created by a natural slash supernatural uh, a source. And a big part of that creation process um, has been the human consciousness aspect. As soon as you give attention to this subject, doesn't matter, you know, you could be thousands of miles away from where it's happening. Uh, you affect it uh, with the energy of a consciousness in, in some way. And uh, you may not know it, you may not see it, you may not sense it, but if you, if you hit it, or, um, if you uh, say, think something, say something, do something that is, a, that is right about it, if you perceive something... Uh, and like we have, for example, we, we and other people we know have thought things privately, said things privately, written things, drawn things, and then they've manifested in the field. And the way this, the, this phenomenon uh, unfolds and behaves and responds, it's, it's like a, a global poltergeist rather than an extraterrestrial intelligence. What, what is the best use we can make of the crop circles? And we have about five or six minutes left. Right. Well, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to say.
say, really. Um, well, one is I think that the reason why they've been happening, and, and again, you, you, you need to make disappear from the record all of the human formations. And if you can't do that, then you put a question mark over it. But with those formations, whose proponents of evidence point to it being either extraterrestrial created formation or something that could be uh, natural, supernatural, um, is that uh, when you look into it, it teaches you something. You learn something far more than what you, you knew previously about it. And that is something that distinguishes a genuine formation, a genuine you know, non-man-made formation from, say, one man-made. Um, I've seen formations which to your eyes say to you that this is genuine because of the research and experience we've, we've had. When we start researching it, uh, we discover things in it um, that were obviously put there uh, by an intelligence, um, which just is more than what anybody knew at that time. And uh, so uh, there are things to be learned. But maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry <clears throat> for clearing my throat. I think maybe one of the real important things that, that, uh, to boil it way down is to learn the power of our, our, our thoughts and our intentions to, yeah, and our right. consciousness, what effect our consciousness has on co-creating our world. That's and right. if we're putting out a lot of negative things, we're, we're putting that out there into the mix. And, and if we can learn the potential of our consciousness and, you know, uh, the purpose of creation is to perfect itself, we believe, you know, and if we, if this planet survives long enough for the perfection of, of humanity. consciousness, yeah, that, of humanity that lives here, then there's some amazing, uh, spiritual, uh, enlightenments and awakenings. In, found. in 1999, I gave a, a series of talks in England uh, called Co-Creation, The Message of Crop Circles. And this is really what, what we're saying. Um, there's more than one message. There's more than one thing um, communicated uh, to us and whoever is researching the phenomenon and humanity in general in these formations. There's more than one thing being said. But all of these things, uh, that have been communicated uh, for now more than two decades. Um, what they, the, the, the overall message seems to be through the crop circle phenomenon uh, is what Chris just said, is that we co-create this. And there we're is not an the infinite, creators. Infinite, yeah, infinite, yeah. Sorry. We're, we're, not, we're not the mental, psychic creators. We, you know, I, I sat on a hill with, with eight other people in 92. Uh, Stephen Greer was, was there, and he suggested it was a spontaneous experiment. He said, let's think of a design for the circle-making intelligences to make. So we all sat quietly for two minutes, and then he asked each of us in turn what we thought. There was nine of us in total. Um, interestingly, seven out of nine of us in that two-minute silence all thought the same thing. So uh, there was collective consciousness there working within the group. So he said, okay, let's visualize this. Let's just transmit this out into the universe. We didn't know if anything would happen. We didn't try to will it to happen. But there it was, a few hours later, a few miles away, for the very first time ever, showing, in my view, just another example, and there have been many, that we are the psychokinetic co-creators of this phenomenon. We're not the creators of it, but our consciousness is very much involved in the creation process, which is also why it's been reflected back to us in the design of the formation. Um, of course, you have to know, too, that uh, human hoaxing, human, uh, I should say, deceptive human circle making has been uh, rampant since 1990. And it's been, become such a problem that, uh, in our view, um, most, most people would have a hard time seeing the clear communication, if, if they could see it at all. From all of the graffiti. Well, you know, there's something among us that does not want that clear communication to be seen. Uh, there is a very dark side to the human species. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. th that darkness is deeply invested in all of us. It's why a whole country like Germany or uh, a whole people like the people of the, uh, the uh, that are committing genocide in Dorfur 
can do what they do. Uh, the the Rwandans uh, can do what they do. That darkness uh, that is within us must be treated with respect, kindness, and compassion. If it is embraced with love, then it becomes strong in ways that make us do things that mark our souls, such as you're describing. Yes, and, and bringing the light to the subject, the truth to the subject, is also extremely important, especially in this time we're living in when deception uh, has has very much been running amok. Well, deception um, and secrecy, ever since World War II, a cancer uh, began to form in the culture of the world in the form of secrecy, which is now the central reality of our time. This mm, yeah. g- gigantic tumor of secrecy has really destroyed uh, this culture, and it means it's a sign of the end, that this culture will not survive, that it will be bones, just like the Roman Empire is now bones, because it denied human beings the chance to be free, and we will not stay, it will not stand in the end. We have just a couple more minutes. If you have a, a last comment for us, this is the time. Well, uh, what I was going to say, uh, too, about the, uh, the, the overall thing that you can learn from the genuine non-man-made crop circle phenomenon beyond the extraterrestrial element is that the natural supernatural source, the intelligence behind those formations that have, that have been responsible for those, is an infinite one. It's a divine one. It, it, it could be uh, what uh, you call God or, or equivalent, uh, certainly. Um, for example, uh, many people, including ourselves, have asked, the big question, who or what is creating the crop circle phenomenon? That answer, the answer to that question has been given over and over and over again every year in the wheat field since 1980. It's the reason, one of the reasons we call our website Crop Circle Answers. The answer has been found in sacred symbols. It's been given to us on the land as a communication. You know, we, we ask the question, the answer has been given. And it's for us to recognize the answer has been given, and it's been given over and over. And what is the answer saying? Well, the intelligence is infinite. The intelligence is a collective intelligence. It's beyond extraterrestrial intelligence. It's more like the intelligence of the universe. And that is one of the things we as a species need to learn and take on board in our understanding of things and where we fit into the scheme of things. Because, uh, as I said earlier, um, we're all cosmic beings. We're all born of this creation, of this universal creation, as are the extraterrestrial beings, including the ones that come with uh, not good intent or come with uh, selfish motives, um, don't have our uh, uh, best interests at heart, um, among the many that do, um, is that we all were birthed by this universe. And uh, what is the intelligence behind it? Well, it appears to be a collective, infinite mind of which we are all part of. We're all connected to it. And uh, this has been reflected in the crop circle formations as, as, uh, through the design symbolism, the geometry, the mathematics, the phenomenal events that occur uh, either side of the event or with it. And uh, this is one of the big things to learn. So if someone said to me, can you please tell me what's been creating the worldwide crop circle phenomenon in one sentence, I'd have to say, man, E.T., and God. If you were to break, if you were to wow. research those, you know, there's more than one source. Yes. There's more than one source. And if you look at each one of those, man, E.T., and God, or universal mind, um, there's more than one aspect. We have it. come to the end of our time together. I'm very sorry because we could obviously talk for a much <laughs> we longer could, yes, we time. Could. We have a lot Their website, time. cropcircleanswers.com. Ed and Chris Sherwood, on a deep and extraordinary journey. It's a busy city location. Um, I've lived here now for 14 years, emigrated from England, and it's been a location that I haven't really, uh, really thought to be a good location to witness UFO sightings. And so for many years, uh, if I wanted to try a, a CE5 type of uh, 
human-initiated interaction type uh, event, I would usually go to a remote location to do that, like I'd done for many years in England. But uh, in early 2006, I uh, was trying to recover from a serious illness, and while doing so, I would take short walks around the, the, the city blocks where we live and watch the sky and uh, reminisce almost about the, the times when uh, I would uh, do meditations in England uh, of healing and world peace meditations, either alone or with a group of people. And before to do so, to send out a mental invitation to any benevolent ET intelligences out there, um, near or far, um, to to participate in the meditation that I was going to do if they were aware of it and, and they could and uh, it was safe for them to do so. And also I would ask for permission, uh, if it was possible for anything to appear, to record that. Um, and at first, you know, I, I did this, uh, more out of a, a, a nostalgic missing the times when I used to do this. Um, but I know that nostalgia very well. Yeah. And uh, just sitting at a bus stop, watching the sky, quietly doing the meditation, you know, not, not announcing it to anyone, but first doing that mental invitation, sending that, that sight that happened just before I was nine. This later one at 15, uh, again, because... The object came so close to me, and I had no prior warning. Uh, even though for years I had asked for a close encounter, um, when it was suddenly given to me, um, I was frozen to the spot with fear again. And when this experience ended, it was a fairly brief experience, at least to my conscious memory, um, I was in, kind of annoyed uh, initially with the intelligences because of the way it happened. And then I was annoyed with myself because I thought, well, uh, it, when I really examine the experience, the conscious memories I have is that nothing negative actually happened to me except my own fear. So because I wanted to have more interaction experiences and I wanted to understand what was, what was happening and the truth of it, I understood that I had to learn to at least overcome my fear of the experience then perhaps I would be able to see what was really happening or I would at least be able to deal with it um, uh, more appropriately or respond uh, better. So the way I did that, this was I took myself off alone to woods and forests. Um, woods and forest is in England? Yes, I was living in, growing up in Norfolk, a rural area of England uh, at the time where the highest number of UFO sightings were occurring at that time. This would be in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, in Norfolk, you have the, uh, or you had the American military air bases which had nuclear weapons. So uh, perhaps that's why there were so many sightings there. And I was living right amongst this. And so when I had this experience, which afterwards I thought, well, okay, the, the, uh, a flood of, of mental impressions um, I'm sort of not going through the whole account here, but uh, you know, I witnessed the being uh, and uh, was was terrified uh, when I had this experience initially. And uh, the being said to me, uh, "Don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you." Uh, and I was paralyzed at the time. And I remember as soon when as you I say you were paralyzed at the time. Do you mean that the being had paralyzed you, or you were ill? No, no. Um, I was paralyzed by fear. Oh, fear. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yes. Um, that, I've had one or two. Uh, that is a. That is something that happens. Yes. 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 It it it, it can completely, uh, in a way, ruin the experience, and it it took some years to overcome that. But um, in this instance. Um, no, Ed, you're going really quickly. This phrase, "it took some years to overcome that," is important to us because behind those words or an effort that you made. Could you describe a little bit about that effort for us? Because it's very important to those of us who are also trying to do this. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, fear is the biggest stumbling block I think we human beings have in our lives. And um, of all the fears we can possibly have, uh, they all seem to reduce down to just one fear, and that's the fear of not surviving. Um, whatever we perceive, the threat to be, whether it's actual
actual or imagined, um, it's a threat to our survival that really puts us in that fight or flight response. And I had a close encounter experience at age 15 where an object came within 30 feet of me while I was walking the family dog. And like the previous time that I just very briefly mentioned, which was a bedroom visitation experience, uh, transmitting that psychic invitation, um, an object turned up in clear view uh, minutes after I sent it out. And this, of course, is something I'd witnessed many, many times in England. So it took me back a bit. And uh, I had seen one or two things over Santa Monica prior to that, but it was a case of um, uh, you know, I'm walking through the town. Uh, since childhood, I've had a, a clairvoyant ability uh, to sense the presence of objects when they are uh, in close proximity. Usually, uh, if an object comes within two miles of me, um, I'm, I'm like a weather barometer. I, I now, pick wh- it up. Why is this, do you think? I think it's mostly to do with uh, the core purpose of my um, sole purpose in this lifetime, my my uh, sole contract, if you like, um, to quote a friend, um, uh, that uh, I, you know, we, we all, I think, uh, come into this world with um, knowledge that uh, we commonly forget in the process of birthing and growing up and, and, and taking on uh, uh, the civilization we grow up in. You know, we forget a, a lot. And um, in my case, at a very early age, uh, just before I was nine years old, I had a, an extraterrestrial encounter experience that really turned my life upside down, uh, even as a nine-year-old child. Um, and, and what this in, uh, first initiating face-to-face encounter experience did for me was, one of the things it did was it, it made me aware that uh, we live many lives and that death, physical death, is not the end. And uh, so, uh, and from that experience, too, I, I experienced... Uh, Today, Dreamlanders, we've got a very interesting couple with us, Ed and Chris Sherwood from Santa Monica, California. They are crop circle researchers, but also have had extensive paranormal experiences and involvement in this whole area and have had UFO experiences and, in particular, have successfully communicated with and called UFOs from time to time. And this is, of course, of interest to all of us because everyone would like to be able to do this, and we know it's possible. I used to do it from time to time successfully. Stephen Greer has his methods. Other people have their methods. But I thought from what I heard of what the Sherwoods had been doing, that maybe their ways of dealing with this were very much more sophisticated. Ed and Chris Sherwood, I would like to welcome you both to Dreamland. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Whitley. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Whitley. It's wonderful to see you. Well, wonderful. I'm so glad. And uh, we are all together now that Ann and I have moved to Santa Monica. I'm such a workaholic, though I rarely get out. So I think, Ed, I saw you on the street once a couple of years ago. That's or true. You, you recognized me, mm-hmm. and I have no idea who you were. And I was uh, there was a brief correspondence, but we weren't living here full-time then. We were still all over the place, so we never, never actually gelled. But we ought to get together at some point uh, and uh, see each other. It would be really fun. I think you just live a couple of blocks away. Well, I'm not sure how far away we live, um, no, but we'd but, love to um, do that. Sometime. We could certainly meet. Yeah. Yeah, you live. Uh, you now, it, where you do live is somewhat important to this to this show in the sense that um, uh, you, you tell us a little bit about your location and and what it's like and why you see UFOs there. Well, it's 